Welcome to a special episode of the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on the series, I have Professor Bashara Dumani, who is a professor of history and the Mahmoud Darwish Professor of Palestinian Studies at Brown University, and was the former president of Birzeit University. Bashara, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mikey. It's good to be with you. I should say for context that this episode is being recorded at um, 8.44 p.m. in um, Palestine time on Tuesday, October 24th, just since it is very much a day-by-day and hour-by-hour situation. Um, the series of episodes that we've been doing this week and last week have all been about giving people historical context about how we got here. Um, and I very much wanted to have you on the series because, as I told you before, I wanted to have a sober conversation about the historical context of what brought us here. Um, but before we sort of get into that, maybe we can talk a little bit about your work as a historian and give people context about what you've spent your career studying and some of the work that you've produced. Sure. Thanks. Um, I'm a social historian. This means I'm interested in the ordinary lives of people. My focus is on the uh, pre-colonial period, for the most part, that is to say the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, which were centuries of Ottoman rule in the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm interested mostly in Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, that area. Uh, I've... Uh, most of my career, I just focused on those people's uh, groups, that is to say, uh, times, places that have been marginalized in mainstream scholarship. Um, often, what's not talked about or what's marginalized tells us a lot about how we produce history and why. I uh, did my first book on uh, Jabal Nablus in Palestine and focused on merchants and peasants between 1700 and 1900. I was really interested in how Palestinian society looked like before the colonial period. Convinced that uh, its social structure, its economy, its culture, its politics um, that developed over hundreds of years uh, have a lot of impact on uh, what happened in the 20th century. That is to say, they should Palestinians should be written into history as agents of history as well and not be erased or marginalized. Uh, I wrote uh, a book on family life um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, questions of gender and property for the most part, and Islamic law based on uh, Sharia records, again, yeah. going back to the 17th century into the 1860s or so. Uh, I was really interested, why is it that... Uh, a place like northern Lebanon and Tripoli area had very different conception of what family is and how property should be devolved from one generation next than a place in southern Syria like in Nablus uh, had almost an opposite understanding of these fundamental things. And this threw into question the idea that there is a monolithic Arab society, monolithic Arab culture, monolithic uh, our family, in fact, there's a, an incredible amount of diversity. And it's precisely in recovering this richness and diversity of the past, especially in the ways that ordinary people made their lives, that gives us a lot of material uh, for rethinking our assumptions and for imagining potential futures. You know, you work with students on a, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. The students that take your classes who are interested in Palestine, let's say non, not cynically, mm -hmm. right? They're interested in Palestine in a compassionate way, let's say. What do you think they most misunderstand fundamentally about what Palestinian society was like pre-1948 or pre-World War I even? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, that they cannot think about the Palestinians outside of what they call the conflict. So the framing of the colonial period, the vocabulary of the colonial period that they use and think through, uh, and it blinds them 
to even be able to imagine what life might have been like before. Um, so uh, everything I say about that period of pre-colonial period is sounds like terribly new. It's it's nothing amazing or dramatic. Belsa was like many other countries and places in the world, very much like Syria, Lebanon and elsewhere. Uh, but somehow they think it's an exception, and they can't imagine it, uh, except in relation to British rule and the Zionist. Yeah, it's it's almost like radical to think of it as a boring a boring place. Yeah, it is. Uh, so there, this this idea of uh, Palestine is the Holy Land, what it means to the West, what it means in terms of the Zionist movement and the conflict, etc. It's like this black hole around which yeah. everything must revolve. But the lives of Palestinians really, historically, far exceeds the colonial period. And it enriches our understanding of what happened in the colonial period. It helps us understand how Palestinians are actors uh, in shaping their own fates, despite the enormous imbalance of power and all that. Uh, but this colonization that took place first by Britain, and then septal colonization by the Zionist movement, took place in Palestine, took place in a society that already existed, took place in a landscape that was already molded through hundreds of generations of people working the land and having a really sophisticated system of land relations and ownership and and yeah. relations with each other. And and they had to adapt to that. They had to, they had to understand it. They had to um, work with it. And it affected how they they behaved. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of people who are empathetic or sympathetic to Palestinians from the get-go uh, have not had to do this kind of work that the Zionists and the British did and tried to understand that society, how its land tenure system works, how its trade networks work, how et cetera, et cetera. They feel that they don't have to know that stuff because they're ready yeah, uh, side with the Palestinians. So you find that the ones who, let's say, are politically on the other side have a much better understanding of these because they just have to deal with them. They're interested in the architecture, so as to dismantle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Very well put. And um, it, it's it's unfortunate because in order to understand this architecture. Uh, They've had to do a lot of work. They had to learn languages. They had to do all sorts of stuff. So they produced. The amount of knowledge that's being produced by the other side is enormous. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it must be studied carefully and seriously because a lot of it is based on serious study, regardless of whether we agree the framing or the purpose and all of that. Yeah. You know, we were talking briefly before to schedule this call. And you, you said two things that I've been thinking about ever since. Um, you talked about, you, you said in passing that, you know, we need to rethink in what ways the pre-colonial history is relevant to what is happening today. So let me ask you, in what ways is the pre-colonial history <laughs> relevant yeah. to what's happening today? Yeah, well... Uh, let's take the West Bank, for example. There is a reason why the pattern of the spatial pattern of Zionist colonization from the 1880s through the 1940s took the shape of what they call the famous N pattern. It, these colonies go along the coast from south of Jaffa all the way to Haifa, and then they drop down at an angle like an N. Uh, through uh, Marj ibn Amr to Lake Tiberias, and then they go back up again, like the other part of the end, to Safad. And uh, there is this kind of hole in the middle. And that hole is what became the West Bank. So I can argue that the West Bank is not an accident of the 67, the 48 war. It just happened to be where the armistice lines were drawn up. It was, in a way, predestined to be that because... This was the hill area of Palestine where small land owners prevailed, whereas the coast was an area because of the great agricultural expansion and growing economy of Palestine in the 19th century is where 
large land owning um, and much more sort of uh, dispossessed peasantry. Kind of. And it is those people and those relations that made it much easier for the Zionist movement to buy land or to take over land in those regions than it was in the hill areas, which they had a hard time getting Palestinian small landholders to sell or to establish themselves in those areas, even though that's the area that historically they claim as their religious sort of real estate, uh, Judea and Samaria, as they call it. So when the partition plan of 37 or 47 was drawn, you also saw this big hole, which was the hill areas, joined to another big hole, which was the Galilee, which is also hill area. Mm. And it's not an accident that the West Bank and the Galilee, because they were hill regions dominated by small peasant landowners, have been the hardest to Judaize for the Zionist project. And if you look at where the destruction of Palestinian villages in 48 took place, they surround this hill region. And so I think we have to understand what land relations were like for Palestinians. What was the importance of the uh, hill cities on the spine of these hills from Hebron in the south through Jerusalem, Nablus, and Nazareth, etc.? How they existed as cities, their relationship to the countryside, and so on and so forth. And this is a very short version, of course, but I, I think that's one way to think about it. Um, and there are many other lessons we can draw based on what was uh, Palestinian political culture like under the Ottomans. They had a great deal of autonomy and self-rule. A place like Nablus did not have an Ottoman garrison in almost 400 years of Ottoman rule. Uh, native sons ruled. That made an impact on how people thought power, where it lay, how it's uh, refracted through these local leaders, what can they do in order to make a political statement, etc. Yeah. So, and and we see that play itself out, and uh, during the years of, uh, and I would finally say it was a complex class stratified society. So there's it's not a accident that the largest rebellion that the British faced uh, in the first half of the 20th century, in any of their colonies, was in Palestine. It's not an accident that uh, the largest revolt that the British Empire faced in the first half of the 20th century was in Palestine, or that the peasants were the backbone of that revolt. And for the peasants, and I'm here referring to the idea that a stratified society existed in a pre-colonial period which had an effect on that revolt, these peasants were upset not just at the Zionists and not just at the British, but also at the landowners themselves. And uh, they set up almost like field courts in which they put on trial uh, some of these large landowners. And one of the first things they did is they canceled their debts to these owners. So there is a lot of energy, time, effort, and concern among Palestinians at internal stuff that the other rest of the world doesn't really see, but which really helps configure how they relate to parties outside of the Palestinian society. Yeah. I, since you're here, I want to use you as a resource for me to have conversations. When I do have conversations um, with people who are trying to make sense, whether they are Zionists or not Zionists, and I'm trying to help them understand my perspective. One of the things that I hear up a lot, I hear a lot, and I heard this interview with Golda Meir in 1970, where she talks about Mandate British, like uh, British Palestine. It's a, a very famous interview. And she says, well, Palestine uh, on the British maps was on both sides of the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. um, and I went online to go look, uh, look at these maps. Every time I looked at these maps, they were always from the Zionist websites. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some historical <laughs> context and sense of where they are coming up with this this uh, thread and yeah, sort of debunk this idea a little bit? Well, uh, the Zionist movement itself was divided politically between the revisionists who were more right-wing and whose sort of inspiration were the brown shirts of Mussolini and so on, and uh, the left-wing, which really controlled and 
in, in many many ways uh, found the, the main institutions of uh, what later would become Israel, from IDF to the Institute. And one of the issues that the revisionists kept raising over and over again is that the British already stole half our land, they would say, because it was on both sides of the river. Yeah. And uh, this, the, these left-wing Zionists are accepting that. And we should never accept that. We want all of Palestine. And why did they have this idea? Well, it's very simple, really. All these boundaries that were formed by the British and the French initially through the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916 and then after World War uh, I <clears throat> are arbitrary boundaries based on the interests of colonial powers. So <clears throat> what these revisionists, <clears throat> excuse me, were talking about is the British initially had in mind that Palestine would be both the West Bank and the East Bank of the Jordan River. But then for a variety of reasons having to do with the fact that they found opposition to the establishment of these new boundaries by the Sykes-Picot, they brought in uh, the Hashemite family, put one son of Sharif Hussein as king of Iraq and another son uh, as king of, of, of what they called Transjordan at the time. And in order to secure that border south of Damascus, because the French were claiming that area as well, and there was disagreements, and that happened to be Damascus, the capital of what is supposed to be the United Arab Kingdom. And the, and the British and the French are both facing a lot of uh, problems from people saying, what are you coming here to do? This is supposed to be Arab Kingdom. Uh, they needed to secure that border. And so they established Transjordan. And uh, they cut it out of what they imagined in the beginning as part of Palestine. Now, so this is a tempest in a teapot. Really, yeah. But but there there's another issue here, and that is the West Bank and the East Bank, and this is another lesson from the pre-colonial period. We're the, we're like, you know, a married couple. Yeah. Uh, so Nablusi merchants uh, opened up houses in the Salt region. They carried a lot of trade with the Azlun region. Or the famous Nablusi soap industry, in order to survive dependent on Bedouins bringing in um, pre-chemical, pre uh, what they called sheed, or, uh, sorry, kili, which, which was very important to soap production. And that was only found in plants and in the barilla plant in the desert, etc. There was enormous and dense networks between the two. So that line is arbitrary in, in many ways, but so are the lines between the Galilee and South Lebanon. Yeah. Or, or between Aleppo and, and Syria and Turkey, it's east, south. I mean, all these are all new uh, <clears throat> kind of lines, and we cannot take them. It's always been natural, and somebody's been deprived of a piece of it. Yeah. So you're you're giving us historical context, right? Okay. The person listening to this, as well as I, um, uh, I'm learning a lot, and I'm taking all this stuff in. <laughs> Which brings me back to something else you said to me. Um, and you, you said something about like, what does it mean to be historically informed mm -hmm. instead of exclusively morally outraged? Mm -hmm. Especially in the context of being on social media, seeing horrific photos and heartbreaking videos and soul numbing statistics. Um, and which causes quite naturally, if you have a heart, moral outrage. Yeah. Walk me through that, that sort of how those two things can coexist as well as yeah. like the We're dichotomy gonna... between them. Uh, historians are human beings and they have every right to be morally efficacious anybody else. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so that's normal. It's also very normal, in fact, important that scholarship be engaged, meaning that it's based on a political relationship with the subject matter and the sense of why are you studying the subject? Uh, 
and why do you focus on this instead of on that? These are all, in a sense, personal and political decisions that are made. And it's not that some people are able to dissociate themselves and then do something separately from who they are as human beings. Uh, these people are kidding themselves. I think it's incumbent upon all scholars, including and maybe especially historians, to be upfront about why they chose the subject, why they're interested in this question, why they want to pursue it in the way they do. I'm completely frank about I chose to study uh, nablus and peasants and merchants because they were a race in Palestinian history. And I felt that in order for Palestinians to be able to find justice one day and really struggle successfully for it, they might they must be written into history. They must have a story to tell about who they are. So it was an explicitly, uh, in a way, engaged kind of scholarship that I was doing. This doesn't mean that I can't be a professional about it, that I don't invent sources, I don't invent facts, uh, but it leads me to uh, discover places that other people aren't looking in many ways. So that's yeah. one thing. Well, but the other issue about moral outrage is that, and then what? And, and then what? Uh, moral outrage, in a way, is a leveling force. You could be morally outraged about the killing of any innocent people anywhere at any time for any reason. Right? And if that's all you feel, then you don't, you're not really understanding the world. Well, why does it happen more to this group than that group? Why does it happen at these times, in these ways, etc.? In other words, what can we know that would help us change this? Mm -hmm. um, moral outrage is a great engine for us to, to give us energy to do and pursue, and try to do stuff, but by itself, it's not enough. Um, so that's what I meant by that. Um, and I, I, I would add a third sort of angle to this, which is moral outrage often depends on an essentializing binary, victim, perpetrator, resistor, or colonizer, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas most people live their daily lives um, in the shadow of these power relations, making co micro compromises as they go along in order to survive and in order to find ways that to resist that, that are actually doable for them. And that is the world in which people actually live. It's a much messier world. And the past is much messier than moral outrage would let us live as well. And how to deal with this messiness how to find our way forward, I think, requires historically informed analysis, personally. No matter what field you're in, whether you're in literature or anthropology or uh, an activist or whatever you are, if you don't have a sense of why we are where we are, a sense of that historically informed sense, it's difficult to really be effective and to pace yourself for the long struggle. What does that look like in practice? I mean, like when you speak to your students or you speak to me, right? I'm not, I'm not engaged in, in scholarship. Um, I'm not looking through, you know, reports about what was happening in these places 200 years ago. How does that change how I intellectually interact with what's happening right now? How does it help me? How, how can I filter that approach or that what you just said into an approach that will inform how I engage yeah, I, with what's I, happening? I don't think there's a formula which translates this chemical reaction. Some other chemical yeah. reaction like this, I really don't. <clears throat> it's a way of being. I mean, I can answer this on many levels. On one level, uh, I can say, well, for some people, uh, they believe that justice shall prevail. That's just the law of the world. Um, you know, Obama famously talked about this all the time. You know, the arc of justice. The, the moral arc of justice yeah, bends yeah, towards. You know, yeah, you know, it, it will happen. Well, as a historian, I can tell you that's bullshit. <laughs> it, there, there's a billion examples of how that doesn't work in, in real life, <laughs> right? 
And so if you, if one day you say moral, you know, arc of justice, arc of justice, and then you just get depressed because you never seem to be getting there and you stop. Yeah. Well, what if you say, well, I know that this doesn't exist and let's find other reasons why I do what I do, right? Uh, why should I um, continue to struggle for something that's not guaranteed is going to happen, even if in the next generation? Then you have to find other reasons. And these reasons are historically informed reasons, right? You know, change will happen. Things will change. Are we getting ready for that change? Are we pushing forward? Uh, what can we learn from what we've done in the past that will help us do something differently this time or in a better way? And, uh, well, yeah, I, I look at historically informed stuff and I say, uh, this has helped me understand what my beliefs and, and, and priorities are, and I'm going to live by them whether I know I'll succeed or not. And there's a famous saying, pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will. And in a way, being historically informed makes you, and rightly so, critical and pessimistic. Like, is this right? Is, am I saying something that makes sense? Is it true? Etc. What if I, I get the answers that don't give me a lot of hope? Well, then there's this optimism of the will that I do what I do because that's, I want to live according to my principles and values. So, and I think you need both. You definitely need both. And uh, you can't just live on principles and values and hope without understanding why you are where you are. Does that make sense? I don't know. It does. It does make sense. I mean, I wonder this, I mean, this is very much like me asking for a friend. <laughs> I'm like trying to figure out how to, how to simultaneously have that optimism of will and pessimism of, of mind. Um, because like, I look at the situation now and it's, it's evident to me that the, the moral arc of the universe does not bend towards justice. Yeah. Right. Necessarily super, bend. I mean, it could sometimes. It, yeah. it could. It could, but it doesn't necessarily bend towards okay. just, justice, right? And so let me just ask you a very basic question. H historically, do people help bend it towards justice or it bends <laughs> one way or the other? Well, yeah. This, this is a question about agency, which of course is yeah. the main concern of especially social historians. So, yes, I believe they do. And that's why I think the most important change is what happens on the ground. I mean, here I am not on the ground. Yeah. And an academic in some institution, right? Uh, I don't kid myself that I, through this interview or something else, can bend that arc. Although I think every little bit helps, and I'm happy to do this, and I do do it all the time. Uh, but it's really people on the ground whose actions, whose decisions make a very big difference. Right now, we're having this conversation, and I'm, every day there's a teaching and so on and so forth, not because we managed to intellectually convince people that this is an important issue they should talk about, but because the people of Gaza and the West Bank and in South Lebanon are paying with their bodies to make a change. That gives us the space to even talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you are in Beirut on the ground, and the, your everyday lived experience will give you a perspective. And every little decision that you make will add to something that will make a difference in the end. I believe it doesn't have to be somebody you know standing up top of the mountain and waving a flag or carrying a weapon or uh, having the largest microphone in the world. It's actually the accretion of little decisions by little people, you know, yeah. iteration after iteration after iteration that sets in motion uh, certain forces. And social historians love to sort of pay attention to that without losing sight of the big picture. So I consider my profession as going between the basement machinery the nuts and bolts of the systems at the basement 
uh, up to the rooftop view. And it's yeah. this journey in back and forth that is actually the most exciting part of my work. And I feel privileged uh, I can do that. You know, one of the things that I think you do, um, you and your entire uh, uh, profession and your colleagues, is help us rethink not only um, our actions, but our words. And, yeah. and um, we talked about this a couple uh, you know, days ago when we, we chatted. Um, and I, I said, you know, Pshad, I really want to talk about Palestine before the term mandatory Palestine um, was used. And you said, yeah, yeah, that, that term um, yeah. drives me crazy. Um, I, 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 I really want to hear you talk about this. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, let's begin with that. Um, everybody says the mandate period. Yeah. But the mandate is just a, a cover-up, really, for what was a colonial period. So uh, if we use the word colonial, British colonial rule in Palestine instead of British mandatory rule in Palestine, there's a big difference in how people react to these words. And these each word carries a different kind of baggage. Colonial clarifies the actual power relationship that exists, the decisions that the British made, the way they, the reasons they acted the way they acted. While mandatory is the fig leaf that they put through the League of Nations about them helping to guide a people who don't know how to rule themselves on how to rule themselves, and then they will leave. In other words, they're out there in kind of an altruistic role. And based, of course, on a completely racist understanding of them not being able to rule themselves and we knowing civilization, etc. Nevertheless, it's, it's a, a white man's burden kind of term. And uh, now, a lot of people who use mandatory Palestine use it in with an understanding that really it's a colonial, they're talking about it in a, in a, as a colonial relationship. But the very fact that they use it and people read it and it's repeated over and over and over again it has a certain kind of power. The same thing about conflict, like the Palestinian Israeli conflict. I mean, I, I think that's the wrong term. It's not a conflict, it's not uh, a married couple fighting over, uh, you know, who owns the house. Um, or uh, custody of the kids when they want to get divorced, so two people fighting over the same land, right? It's not like that at all. It's 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 it's, it's a settler colonial relationship where it's based on two engines, which is demographic displacement to kick as many native people out, and land appropriation to get as much land as possible. And if you have excess population, that you are moving away from the land, but you haven't already kicked out, you sort of concentrate them into these little Gazas, right? There is the big Gaza, which is mostly refugees, 2.2 or 2.3 million. 1.6 of those are 1948 refugees. And the same thing we can say about the refugee camps in the West Bank and about the cities and areas A, B, and C and how they are controlled. So basically, uh, there's been a hundred year process of trying to strip people from the land and concentrate them, if not kick them out. And meanwhile, building colonies, etc. That's not two national movements that have always been around and fell off with each other and said, we don't like each other anymore. We're gonna, you know, I claim this land, you claim that land. It's not like that at all. It's yeah. not a conflict that uh, a good hearted person who's impartial can sit and say, okay, let me, you know, like a marriage counselor, let me work this out for you. No, it's one of, of, of people dispossessing another people. So every time people say the place is really conflict, they are pushing a, what I think is a wrong frame for understanding what's going on, even in the best of intention. You know, it's so funny you were saying that you don't feel like you're on ground zero. But, I can imagine somebody making the argument that this 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 battle will be won or lost in the in the imagination of the American people more so than anyone else, mm -hmm. and that the people who need to be convinced 
and the people who need to understand are that that might actually be ground zero. Does that make sense to you or do you disagree with no, that? No, no, I mean, it, it does make sense to me and I hear it a lot. And uh, that's the other extreme of what I said. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the truth is somewhere, in, I don't, I wouldn't say in the middle. I would say closer to the ground zero being, being Gaza, Palestine, Lebanon, et cetera. Yeah. I still believe that. But yes, first of all, for several reasons. One is um, narratives are powerful. And if you change a narrative inside a powerful country like the United States, that can make a big difference. And actually, we see a lot of, I mean, important changes. The way people talk 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, and the way they talk now, the way they understand, I mean, I think people like myself and the generation before me, my children are helping to build a kind of a very strong foundation for shifting that narrative. That will make a difference, for sure. Um, so I, I don't want to underestimate how important that is, but I yeah. can't tell you how many eloquent, wonderful people devoted their lives to making this kind of difference, and yet it doesn't seem to be really as solid results as they hoped they would be. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that. A, a, a movie like Exodus can help shape a whole entire generation of Americans how they should feel about this issue. But a million books based on millions of facts that clearly demonstrate that the story is like the opposite or different don't have that kind of effect because people don't read books as much as they watch movies. And movies make a bigger difference. So this is the same thing about social media. Academics are not the biggest users of social media. Younger people are. The way that they think and behave often is that in social media kind of dynamics than reading academic books, etc. But in the end, um, we all do from our position the best that we can do. I think that's all you can ask of people. And there is value and a kind of a long shelf life for the kind of work academics do. And I think there are touchstones, important reference points people go back to over and over again in order to make sense. Of I mean, you've been, you've been teaching kids in the States for a long time. Do you feel like Students that come, freshmen that come to your class in 2023 have fundamentally different uh, feelings about Palestine than ones who came in 2003? I do. Uh, especially this generation, the last few years. Hmm. It's quite amazing. Now, I don't know why that happens exactly. You may need to talk to another expert about this. Yeah. But I can tell you from experience, I've seen uh, this generation take for granted lots of stuff that others, other previous generation had to unlearn or struggle with. But just take it for granted. They take for granted that identities are fluid, sexualities are fluid, that uh, justice is important, that climate change is a real issue that there are power struggles going on, that knowledge should be decolonized, etc. And they seem they're already ripe that way, and they're just hungry to uh, learn more and move forward quickly. I don't know why that is exactly, um, but uh, they are inspiring. They're inspiring in, in how they're energetic, and savvy they are. It's not like they have these feelings and that's it. No, they are really good at communicating, organizing, initiating all sorts of stuff. It, I tell you that uh, life would be much more difficult for me uh, if this was not the case. Yeah. Uh, give me hope. 
And I don't know if uh, I'm in a bubble where these kids tend to Shame. enter and whether the rest of the world is actually completely different. Uh, but I've heard many, many other people speak about this generation in the same terms, and I'm optimistic. You know, a lot has been made um, on social media of muzzling of pro-Palestinian academics mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, public intellectuals, um, in particular in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, is that over, are those concerns overblown? Are those concerns underestimated? Um, what does it feel like in the academy? Obviously, you're not going to speak for everyone, but it It'd be curious. I'd be curious to know from the inside um, if those those concerns are real. Oh no, those concerns are real for sure, and uh, most of their effect is hidden from you. I mean, you hear about the case of these brilliant students who have these landed these top jobs, and then the heads of these companies are withdrawing their job offers because they, you know they tweeted something in support of Palestine. Uh, it's true that um, uh, some faculty and students have been punished and uh, pro-Palestinian speech has been criminalized, especially in Europe, but also in the United States in many ways. And uh, it's true that, uh, you know, the three Muslim anchors of an MSNBC suddenly disappeared from the air. It's as if having them on is wrong. Uh, it's true uh, that famous writers and other events that were celebrating their work were canceled. You know, there's no shortage of examples. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. What really happens is that for every student that is, speaks out and punished, there's thousands of other students who would have spoken out but now don't, or are afraid to. For every professor that signs a statement, there's dozens and dozens that would like to sign a statement but are worried what will happen to them, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think that's partly why you've seen an avalanche of teachings and statements come out to say, we exist, we're here, we're not afraid to add our names, and a way to help open up a space for an actual conversation that the pro-Israel folks are trying to close that. Yeah. And, and I, my view is uh, this tsunami, this counter, this, this counter revolution, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, but this, this idea of we, we can just go back to 9-11 as if nothing happened since 9-11 and pretend again that it's good versus evil and uh, that uh, there's a high moral case for committing genocide against the Palestinians, as if there's no contradiction here. Uh, yes, we are facing that here in the U.S., and I'm told that in Germany and France it's even worse. Um, but uh, these, this tsunami is breaking on the foundation, on the rocks of, of the work that's been built up in the last generation or so, and I think we'll be able to survive it. Yeah. And it's, it's our duty to speak out regardless. Um, absolutely. I mean, it, it is frightening. It's, um, it's terrifying. Um, I want to ask you two last questions before we sure. wrap up. Um, the first is we talked a little bit about the West Bank and Nablus mm. and, um, for a lot of people, um, Gaza is an open air prison. It's almost a synonym. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was a place before it was a prison. Right. Um, and I'm curious for you, based on your scholarship, what what was society like in Gaza? Um, let's just start pre-World War I, um, and then we can talk a little bit um, and connect the dots. You know, I've been studying Palestine and Palestinians for a long time. Uh, Gaza is one of those places that have been studied very little. Point out a couple of things. First of all, Gaza is the corridor that connects Asia and Africa. And it has been an important port and city 
for a very long time, thousands of years. Anytime people try to rebuild or dig up to build a building in Gaza these days, they come up with Roman ruins, for example. Um, it's a transit point. It's just exactly the opposite of what it is now, historic. A place where goods and people flowed back and forth, and armies, unfortunately, which is why Gaza has been the site of many battles. A third or more of Gaza was destroyed during World War I because the British faced the stiffest resistance from Ottoman soldiers in the Battle of Gaza. And Gaza has been destroyed, a big part of it, after 1967 when Sharon led the what he called the pacification campaign, patterned around the American uh, strategies in Vietnam. The militia of thousands of homes, killing of a lot of people, opening big roads to congested camps in order for the tanks to come through and for Israel easier. And um, Gaza was an important center of learning. Uh, Gaza was a city in which, mo like many other cities in that area, most of its urban real estate, the best parts, were already endowed uh, as walks or trusts for charitable purposes. Uh, Gaza uh, took on a very important role after 1948 because it became part of the pure Palestinian condition of statelessness. It became a geographic territory that is stateless. So at the West Bank and East Jerusalem, what was left over on that side of Palestine that didn't become Israel was annexed by the Jordanian government and made part of Jordan. And Palestine became kind of an illegal or a bad word to use. But uh, Gaza was not. Gaza mm -hmm. was under Egyptian rule, it's true. But it was an open space for political activity in a way that the rest of Palestine wasn't anymore. So what became Israel... Uh, the Palestinians there, 150,000, 200,000 remained out of the entire population, were under military rule in a pass system, like South African pass system, where they couldn't move without getting passes. For 19 years, from 48 to 66, uh, the West Bank was under Jordanian rule, and the Jordanian government was very active in changing its identity. In Gaza, it was different. That's why the leaders of the, what would become the PLO uh, or the Fatah, Yasser Arafat himself was raised in Gaza, Khalil, Al Wazir, Abu Yad, Abu Jihad, a lot of cadres came from Gaza and they started that. It's generative of political forces. But after 67 and their pacification campaign, uh, Gaza had a very difficult time under Israeli rule. Um, and a lot of people start working in Israel in order to make a living. And it became, in many ways, dependent on these remittances from people who would go every day into these labor markets. Um, but when the Intifada broke out, the first Intifada, it was in Gaza. And the first Intifada was also the beginning of Hamas. That also was formed in Gaza. Uh, and uh, the uh, the Oslo Accords, in many ways, were first took their expression in Gaza when Israel effectively closed off Gaza from the rest of Palestine. So it's true that the Gaza siege and it's like uh, a horrible detail of using an eyedropper in order to keep a population somewhat alive, but not really fully. Yes, that can be traced to 2007. Uh, but the actual closure of Gaza uh, to started right with the Oslo Accords in 1993. And suddenly, and over the past 20, 30 years, but especially since 2007, Gaza became the exact opposite of its history became a kind of a holding pen for excess population. And 
forced to live a life so precarious that humanitarian aid was considered a political victory. Yeah. And the idea that they could be the source of the Palestinian national movement and its, you know, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s uh, secular guys, or as a political Islam kind of movement under Hamas, that place uh, in many ways was being suffocated. So that's a, a long answer to a short question. Well, I think that Gaza in many ways um, embodies um, the Palestinian condition after 1948 in a way that no other place does. But because of their struggles, it's no longer the place for appropriation of land, only for storing of people. Because Israel for the first time in its entire history of the Zionist movement, actually withdrew from a place besides the Sinai, and that was from Gaza. And since the Sinai was not technically Palestinian land, the first time they ever withdrew from any place or in this kind of way was in Gaza in 2005. Whereas their intense colonization efforts are in the West Bank. So Gaza and the West Bank are like this two especially distinct sides of an otherwise integrated process, which is demographic displacement and land appropriation. The settlements are, are growing at a fast pace in the West Bank, and the horrible conditions of being caged and abandoned uh, can be best seen in Gaza, even though Israel is very busy building little Gazas inside the West Bank. There are many places that are becoming isolated and herded, people not leaving these areas and not There's, knowing what's going on in the rest of the West Bank. Sorry for that long answer, but no, that's, that's a good. You got a, me going. Yeah. Um, the last question I'll leave you with um, is you know, you alluded to this idea that Gaza is like understudied. And there needs more, we need more scholarship. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're speaking to a thousand um, would be scholars mm -hmm. who are listening to this 19 year olds, 20 year olds, 25 year olds. Um, what are some of the topics that you're like, I just wish these places were studied and these time periods were studied? We need. We need uh, another thousand books written about these topics. Right. Well, assuming these thousand books would make a difference, I'll make the following speech. <clears throat> when I started teaching myself about Palestinian history, I went to the Library of Congress, lived in the stacks for months, looked at everything that's ever been write, written on Palestine, and realized by the end of that time that if we had to stack them according to time periods, there'll be a huge pile on the biblical period, another on the crusader, and another on the British Zionist sort of colonization period. And everything in between 1,500 years were like absent, very little. In fact, at that time, there was not a single book on the 17th century, the entire century, and only one on the 18th. It's, it's the period that was most formative of Palestinian society was completely unstudied. The situation has changed a lot since that time. Uh, but uh, the, we are still in a situation where there are laser beams of light, highly focused on certain uh, certain people, certain questions, and almost complete darkness on others. And this is a result of many different factors. I would say that the Ottoman period is still really worth studying. And let's not say the Ottoman period like most books, focus only in the last 40, 50 years of Ottoman rule, as if the 400 before or 350 before really didn't matter. Everybody's really talking about the 1880s to the 1920s when they talk about the Ottoman period, but that happens to be also the period of the start of Zionist colonization, so it plays into this narrative, into this black hole. What I'm talking about. I would say another is that the hill region still isn't very studied very well. Nazareth, or maybe more than Hebron, but Hebron very little compared to uh, Nablus, Nablus very little compared to Jerusalem, etc. We still don't have a sense of 
of of that. On the on the coastal areas, you have a lot of work on Jaffa, much less on Haifa, almost very little on on Gaza. So there are geographic places that are not been studied. But then you have groups of people, question of peasants, question of laborers, of pastoral nomadic people, of women, uh, of artisans, people who were the overwhelming majority. What were their lives like? What did they do? How did they re- etc. Um, there was, uh, you know, um, a whole, let's say, set of questions around issue of land, because that's at the heart of the central colonial relationship. So there's been a lot of study of issues of land, which is very good. Okay. But again, there are missing pieces in terms of the geography and in terms of people involved. So the Jordanian period is not very well studied at all. Uh, I've written an article about all of this. I should have just started there and said, go read it. <laughs> But it's called the shadow years. The shadow years meaning the years that we don't have much light on. Yeah. And specifically speaking, even though that's also changing, we know far less about the period between 1948 and 1967 than we do about the post-67. But it was precisely during this period that the Palestinians reorganized themselves, even outside of Palestine, found a way to be people again, started new movements and started resuming their struggle. That was a very formative period. Very little known is as little is known about. The period after the 3639 revolt, the nine years that followed or from 39 to 48 were absolutely pivotal. And how Palestinian society kind of recovered from that crushing defeat. Uh what kind of new political forces and, and economic things were going on. And that's very little stuff, really. It's kind of a black hole. Um, these days, you want to go learn about Palestine, you pick up, you go to the library, almost everything is written as a kind of a critique of Oslo and what's happening in West Bank. For you know this past 10, 15 years, people completely forgot about the refugees. So we don't have much on how the Palestinians living in exile are experiencing the Palestinian condition and what are they doing? Now, that's also, there's important exceptions and that's changing. Very recently, there are books on Palestinians in Syria, Palestinians in Latin America, Palestinians in Germany, and so on and so forth. And that's moving. But generally speaking, very little compared to the mountain of scholarship that's critical of the Oslo, the PA, as it rightly should be. It's not the entire story. I could go on and on and on, but I think um, that um, recognizing or identifying these marginalized or raised periods, people's places, this is the holy sort of triad, time, place, agent, um, is really an important exercise for scholars. They should go and take a look, see what's been done, what hasn't been done, and why, and how that relates to uh, it's their sense of what engaged scholarship means. Shada, thanks so much. I uh, appreciate it tremendously. Um, I know you are getting asked to do dozens of, of these, but I really appreciate you taking time to do this. It was a real pleasure, Mikey, and thank you for all the good work that you do. Thanks.